I've seen tons of guys in my own training deal with huge amounts of performance anxiety and be stuck and crippled just like I was. Talk to me a little <laughs> bit about Robert. Well, um, obviously, uh, originally from Connecticut, so not too far away. Uh, we over you in New York. Um, went to school, Trumbull High School, um, right in the south uh, west part of Connecticut. Uh, obviously, went to Franklin Pierce University, but no one, a lot of things that people don't know about me is I was a catcher most of my life up until um, the end of high school. And I decided to transition uh, positions right at the end. Um, so I went to a pre draft workout with the Cincinnati Reds, and they were like, hey, you know, you ever thought about pitching? I'm like, no, never even crossed my mind. Um, hopped on the mound, I was 90 plus. And they were like, well, you probably should roll with this. Like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Um, so basically took out every college offer I ever had, threw it out the window um, on a whim. Uh, ended up going to Franklin Pierce University, obviously one of the top D2 programs in the country for a very long time. Um, and then from there, we went to three regional championships. So played in the NECBL, Cape Cod, et cetera. But I had a very injury-ridden career. Um, multiple shoulder surgeries tore my lap, two rotator cuff tears, labral tears, the works. Um, so for me, hopping into the coaching world, injury has been a huge passion of mine um, just because I suffered most of my career with it and had no guidance or uh, sort of direction of how to get, correct some of the issues I had. Um, so I actually was one of the first OG driveline remote uh, trainees at the point where um, Alice Casilla or most of the time Flama was doing like online training right at the beginning. Uh, so I helped on that and helped me out a lot. I got back up to mid to upper nineties and then had a two or three year professional career and kind of ran wrote right the coaching there. Uh, but that's not what I'm passionate about. And that's my background as far as baseball and life. Uh, but obviously my goal as a, a social media and as a coach general is to provide as much educational content as I can and be the guy I never had at the end of the day. Mm. Cool. Really cool. Now, uh, a part of this transition to uh, later in life has led you, now you're uh, creating a highly successful, what would you call it? Uh, it's a more than just a recovery center, right? Sure. So, um, so I just said some light to sure. your current center. Yeah. Yeah, so obviously, um, I, I manage a iCryo. There is a franchise of all over the country, whether it be Connecticut. Um, there's certain transition in New York, New Jersey, et cetera. But they probably started in Texas, and it's full and encompassing health and wellness and recovery. Now, obviously, athletes are kind of a smaller section of that, but it's helping the general population, whether it be crowd therapy, red light, infrared sauna, IV infusions, the works, kind of elevating people's lifestyles and kind of getting them more into health and wellness um, in an alternative fashion, as opposed mm -hmm. to going traditional medicine, physical therapy, uh, medications, et cetera. Because a lot of people are stuck in this loop where they're kind of relying on medication. Yeah, and relying on yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so we provide a different alternative to a lot of those things to help people, whether it be uh, rheumatoid arthritis or nagging injuries, et cetera. Um, but it's been a huge hit. So um, I would be, you know, you're mentioning, hey, athletes are a, a smaller portion of that population, which I would assume at the end of the day, it is almost somewhat unfortunate, right? Because there's a massive benefit uh, that they could probably experience in that. How often have you now tried to work some of that into your training? Now, obviously, when I first started working for iCryo, I got questions every single day asking people like, hey, is red light therapy beneficial? Is cryotherapy beneficial? Can I use these modalities to elevate my career? Now, when I was playing professional baseball, um, I actually got shot in all like middle red light before they were like a big company. Yeah. And I, obviously I was naive and young. I was like, well, is this really going to help me? So I put it on my elbow a few times like, this is stupid. I don't want to give this away. Give it away to a teammate. Um, but from there, diving into the science behind it of total biomodulation of red light, it's a game changer when it comes to cellular production as far as ATP and helps speeding up the body's healing process. Or a lot of people don't understand that like cryotherapy or cold therapy in general, it's like how we regulate the nervous system. That's the main reason why we do it in the first place is we got to basically regulate parasympathetic versus sympathetic activity and actually boost recovery. Because if I can get more oxygenated red blood cells in the system, I'm going to heal. So that applies not only to athletes, but the general wellness of most people. Um, but it's not something that's really big in sports right now is people don't really take enough uh, buy-in as far as recoveries goes. And it is unfortunate. And like you mentioned, like obviously it's a small point, 
it would, it's a game changer. I mean, we have people in the highest level of sports in Charlotte to youth, youth athletes come in. Uh, but obviously it's starting to expand more and more as time. Um, now, um, what's amazing to me, and and I'm hoping, I'm not going to butcher this, this is uh, something that I had uh, been told or talked about with yeah. somebody else that I know that that runs a, a similar set of operation to you uh, and yeah. how they were using cryo to work with actually um, individuals that suffer from like massive anxiety, depression, right? And, and stuck in just um, this sort of uh, fight or flight state and they could never get their sort of uh, level to switch and turn tough for sure. One bout with cryo completely shocked the system enough to like basically give them, give them a period of time where they could then hopefully alter their, their lifestyle and get themselves into uh, a better mental landscape. Um, similar setup you think from an athletic perspective, and then how do you combat basically some of the, uh, I guess, like um, uh, potential downside of like cold therapy to sure. like let's say lean body mass or or something so forth. No doubt. Obviously, I just kind of speak on the the anxiety, depression. Obviously, yep. the levels there associated with that is I see it on a daily basis of people who struggle with anxiety, depression. Um, and have a difficult time regulating. They're constantly in an anxious state at pretty much all times. I've had people where I'll take them on a tour and open up the crowd chamber and obviously there's a ton of smoke that comes out. It's just because the negative 170 in there and they will lose it and literally try and run about 10 feet back just because of the shock to them. And then seeing these people hop in the crowd therapy and see this massive change of how they're acting on a regular basis um, is amazing right just being in a situation where they can kind of actually take a breath and calm down just from the body's ability to regulate both sides of their nervous system get them out of this heightened state of fight or flight now i think it has a huge obligation to athletes because as an athlete myself after i got hurt uh, i'm not huge into um, mental health and things like that and i'm, I'm becoming more um, educated as far as how anxiety and depression are prevalent in the sports and I know that your background is huge in the mental side of the game. And that's something I'm not, I'm, I'm constantly working on trying to be able to watch that. But for me, I struggled most of my career is mm-hmm. not where I got hurt. Um, I always tried to find a way to get back to who I was. And it was a losing battle from five. And I wasted four or five years of my career because I had no one to guide me in any way, shape or form. I was, Hey, I was this guy. I was this dude. Like I'd never never pitched before, I, I could throw mid to upper 90s, like this is it, and I lost everything uh, and had to fight my way back for a better part of four to five years, ended up having to transfer schools. It was a disaster. And there was no, and it wasn't, I mean, I went to that school in 2009, 2010. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a big thing. It's like, oh, well, hey, I, you got to be mentally tough. It's like, okay, that That's sounds tough. great. Yeah. yeah, it's like, that sounds great in theory, but like, here, every time we throw a ball and turned into a 2 count, a 3 count. It was like panic button inside. It was like, well, what do I do now? And then I walked four guys in a row, hit a guy in the head, out of the inning. There's somebody, I'm looking down at the bullpen and seeing somebody's there. It's just chaos. Um, but it got to the point where like, hey, I had to kind of break through that barrier for four plus years later just to figure it out. Um, and I think it's an issue I see a lot of guys struggle with. And a lot of, I've seen tons of guys in my own training deal with huge amounts of performance anxiety and be stuck and crippled just like I was. Yeah, it's, it's so unfortunate. Um, I would say uh, certainly where I enjoy working with most of the guys in our place more than anything is on the mental landscape side. And I would say I probably answer, uh, you know, 10 times the amount of questions from that regard than we do from any sort of mechanical strength training, anything like that, right? Because it, it, at the end of the day, we can really boil down a lot of the nuts and bolts from the inside, right? With the physiological of like, you know, more strength will tend to help you in the long run in most of these scenarios. So like sort of the mental landscape is such an interesting one. And, and I'm sure from your perspective, right? It, it, we, we over glorify who we were and how great we were. So then we put this on a pedestal and then spend our entire time trying to imagine where that pedestal is. Uh, we start with the, I should be. And, sure. you know, we get stuff chasing the warped perception of what we think we're supposed to be, which is 
obviously not in the present tense. And um, unfortunately, too, as athletes, uh, males as well, uh, we often have a very difficult time celebrating our successes. Um, and and I think um, building off of those uh, because we're, you know, we're taught like, hey, just like, you know, don't pat your back. That's an ego-based thing. You know, you got to be tougher. You got to need the next one, the next one, the next one. Whereas uh, the unfortunate thing is when we depress those, we stop remembering where we just came from and how much that actually took to get to there. Um, so it's super interesting to me. Uh, recently, we just actually had a pro guy that, um, uh, not that I am the greatest lover of the whoop, but uh, the, we, needed, we needed some information and we discovered that it was taking him basically two days to get back out of like balancing his nervous system after an appearance and was stuck with, he comes out of the pen. So that means he's right back into that state. And I mean, when and anybody that has played and especially coming out of the pen, when you have like four or five days in a row of where you've pitched like two or three in that time period and with high pressure and obviously he's at the highest level, so that's even more pressure than I could yeah. ever imagine. Uh, just think about the ramification from a direct perspective on the human body and like how limited your ability to repair, recover, and get back to adapting can possibly be. Oh, for sure. I mean, even for me, starting out pitching while I was in college, I like I had made forty plus appearances in my first year. It was, and then I ended up getting a huge labral tear over the course of time because yeah. not only did I not take care of myself just because I was a eighteen year old at the top of the yep. world and yeah. I spent more time, I spent more time, time um, messing around and anything else. I was the guy where okay, I'd show up to the field, like do an arm circle here or there. And, what it eat and that's yep. the end of it um but i just found a real appreciation after the fact after i heard that that was not really the best way to go about it in any way shape or form just because I, I lost that ability to do that like i could i used to be able to like hey all right i'm ready to go two warm-up pitches i'm in the game but now it's like well now i have to get warmed up get myself mentally ready i mean there's a whole lot of things that go into it that i didn't really see that I kind of, from my side, being very externally focused, dominant, as far as psychologically goes, like I just did it. It was just never, there was no thought involved. Um, and then I turned into so, this internally caught person. Yeah. So let me, let me, let me ask you a question there. Right. So, yeah. um, cause it, it's a, it's a huge battle at the end of the day, right? Obviously training wise, we'd love to keep all our guys external as much as you like, oh, okay. right? For sure. But the problem is you you have this balance between like, hey, here's some education. Don't take too much of it because I don't want you to get, you know, all domed up about it. But in the for sure. breath, we we have this constant necessity to make these transitions between external and internal and then how we apply them. Um, you know, now with a lot of your athletes, right? And and knowing what you know, having gone through a lot of those experiences, um, because I gotta say, in in a lot of situations, um, whether, yes, I'm not producing something physiologically, like in the terms of like throwing a pitch, but even from a business perspective, uh, it gets dangerous when you start thinking internally and everything is, is in here, you, you lose sight of your landscape and what you're actually supposed to be trying to accomplish. So how do you help your athlete create that balance from training to performance? Well, that's actually an interesting question just because I have a very unique perspective on this because I've been on both sides. Like I was very one-sided where there was no thought. You could tell me the date on every single pitch and what I'm doing mechanically. It would kind of just be processed through one ear and out the other and I would just make change. And there was no thought. I would have never got caught up in individual pieces where I'm very like distally focused. Okay, where's my hand in the space when I'm trying to throw this pitch? And it becomes like a nightmare at that point. Problem is in today's baseball landscape, we have more information than ever. And there's so many more mechanical variables and we're getting much more into the science-based aspect of it. And guys get lost. They get into a position where I'm caught up in the data. Like I've seen in pitch design sessions where guys will try and chase a vertical break just for two pitches. And then that's all their folks on the entire time. And the entire other, all the self-organization of the body just goes to shit because it's not in a position where they can actually like put it all together. Now, as far as my athletes, feedback is like the biggest piece for me. I don't, I am very transparent with athletes is I'm not going to provide a massive amount of feedback on a daily basis. Cause not only is it, it's almost like looking through video on ourselves on a regular basis. It, a lot of times counterproductive because we get caught up and lost in the songs. It's like, Hey, well, where's my, 
hip and where's my lower half and this pitch versus this pitch. Like, how do I make this adjustment? I mean, I mean, I'm working with an athlete right now who is getting to this position where he, all he would focus on during the game is where his pelvis is in space, like, mm-hmm. and didn't focus on anything else. Yeah. And this dude is, this dude plays professional baseball and he has no guidance from any sort of coaches. And it's like, well, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to do drill that I did in the past to create the same feel, but can't find it. So now I'm watching video. It's like, well, you're creating paralysis for over an hour, over analysis, like instantaneously. It's like, well, I can't just watch my own video and expect to put it all together. And I did that after I got hurt was I'd watch tons of video of like, dude, what's wrong with this? Like, why can't I do what I did before? And it's funny because after I got out of it and started coaching on a high level and I started training at a high level again, I got, I was like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to try and throw like I used to just on a whim and see what happens. And then it was like plus six, like, well, the blueprint, that's the thing is I'm a very big believer in the blueprint for higher level athletes specifically is already there. It's finding a way to. Oh, I, I 100% agree. <laughs> it's so, it's so natural. We fuck yeah. it up. Um, uh, it is so natural. And I am so guilty of it too. Uh, yeah. Over doming guys up and, and over coaching. And I think it is. Um, I think for 99% of the coaches, I don't mean to cut you off, but for no, 99% please. of the coaches, I think their intentions are wholehearted and pure, and they are really just trying to help a kid. And you can't even help but share information when you get excited about seeing something that you might be able to change, but you're like, uh-oh, like he didn't need to know all that. He, he just needed to get maybe this drill or get maybe, hey, when you're doing throwing today, be creative and come up with a metaphor that he can think about to keep it external and and something like that where you just jump the gun a little bit and you end up altering that main blueprint. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm guilty as well. Early on when I was coaching, it was like, well, my knowledge base is X. I see this guy moving a certain way. I know what he needs to fix. So, all right, let's explain it to him in this way. And then it's the complete wrong way because I just overloaded him. Kind of like the same concept of like when I go on social media and kind of go through my massive like in-depth posts. It's like, yeah, is this how I would explain to an athlete? Absolutely not. I'm providing education for the masses. And if they have questions on how to oversimplify and apply, I mean, uh, simplify and apply into their own training, I can answer those questions and kind of change the script to kind of fit that mold. Mm. So if I tell someone, it's like, hey, your hip internal orientation dominant, like, you need to focus on X, Y, or Z because your attitude is tighter. I mean, there's a thousand different variables at play, but if I try and communicate that to an athlete, it becomes an absolute shit show because they're focusing on, well, I need to lengthen my adductor. I need to kind of find pressure on the middle of the ground under my soil. I need to do this, this, and this. And it's now it's internally focused on it the entire time. And now I've kind of shot myself in the foot and shot him in the foot just because I got excited and I'm over explained. So uh, it's such an interesting paradigm that you just mentioned there because it is my biggest problem with where social media has pretty much taken itself, right? And it, I've I've gone way away from it and tried to like, obviously you have a brand, you need to like be on social media, you need to talk about stuff like this. Conversations like this are, are actually how that should be occurring, right? Because you just got to explain in context why you're posting the way you're posting and, and what you're doing, right? And, and, and look, for, for at the very least, you're explaining to people, look, I understand these really complex situations that are going on. Um, do I think that they all need to be applied in this way? Obviously not. But um, I think it's really difficult to then like harbor whether or not a kid reading this as well. Is he now going out and just taking this out of context? Like, I can't tell you how many times you've had kids come in, they're coming in for an eval and they're like trolling with some like altered like mechanic or, or something. And they're like, yeah, I watched this, like one video that you guys put out or like Fed put out or, or this place put out. And, and they were just like, but like, you know, I've been trying to get into, and I'm like, dude, 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 dude. That's like, I was talking about one specific type of individual. Like you don't sit, like look at the guy that I'm talking about and then look at you. And, and it, it is so difficult because I, I don't fault the kid. He's yeah. doing everything possible to try and, to try and do it. But, you know, um, we've had, uh, Dean Jackman on here and I'm, I'm good buddies with Dean and, and Dean always remarked, you know, his biggest mistake growing up was that he did not have a really credible coach at a very young age. And he remarked that that was the case because what he was saying is like, yeah, I, I would have done anything in the world to get better. And I just thought like, oh, I can figure it out. I can do this. I can do that. I can, I can read this thing. I can read that thing. And when you're young, 
and you're somewhat, you know, intellectually immature or, or emotionally immature, and you're willy nilly applying it all and hoping that it all comes together. And unfortunately, what happens in a lot of those situations is like you end up, you end up putting yourself in these positions that just are so completely unnecessary. Um, but, you know, I, and I, I completely, uh, I guess, can empathize with that position of like putting it out in that way. And you almost have this like, I hope everybody understands, like, that's not how you should be talking to somebody. Um, so like, all right, let's take uh, social media. Let's let that have a backseat for a second. Let's talk sure. about now. Um, most of your guys that you work with at this point now are remote, right? Correct. Okay. So when we're dealing with a remote individual in comparison to like a in-house individual, right? We have uh, obviously the access of having hands on and, and being there, which can be both good and bad. Um, and then, but we tend to have access to a little bit more feedback when we're in-house, right? And, uh, you know, this is certainly a struggle that we have too. And, you know, you and I have talked offline a lot about this, that that's my biggest problem with remote training is if the athlete is not providing me any feedback, uh, this is a literally one-sided scenario. And, and I feel guilty, but at the same time, like, it's like, like, you have to understand what you signed up for. So sure. what, what, how do you sort of circumvent that scenario? And then what data point are you really grabbing at to try and help you effectively progress this individual? Yeah. I mean, so for me, that, I mean, that's a really good point. It is. I've had athletes, even in my previous employment, where they wouldn't respond for weeks and weeks on end and expect the same result. It's like, well, at the same time, the biggest problem with remote training itself is a lot of times we, as I mean, as business owners, et cetera, we tend to take things as the masses and not that guys enough. Right. So for me, the way I, the kind of approach that I take is I bet guys on massive amount uh, of variables. Um, and that's why they do an intake form and figure out, hey, how much feedback are you looking for for a week? How fast are you looking to see results? Like, what are you looking to improve? What do you think your biggest struggle is? And getting all these uh, subjective feedback points just to find out, okay, is this an athlete externally focused or internally focused already? Right. How much in, how much feedback do they actually want? How much feedback will help him? Um, and a lot of times I have conversations with guys during uh, initial interviews. That's why I force an application process because I need to find out who you are. And if you're looking for me to give you feedback every single day, we're not going to align as we should. And that's a very unique approach because yeah, I'm going to have less athletes. Am I, is that going to relate? create less athletes free? Maybe, maybe not. But I want to do the best I can to help the athlete in itself. And if he's stuck in this very internally focused kind of slot, a lot of times we, remote training is not the best for them because I can't provide that feedback on a minute to minute basis. And I can't get to the point where I say, I can make a meaningful impact. Because at the end of the day, I, what I want to do, why I do what I do, it's because I want to be that person I never had. I want to make that impact on a high level. And in this word, and if you need more feedback, I'm going to refer you out to somebody else who can give you that feedback and get you what you need. Because at the end of the day, it's, I'm not always the best person to help you. And I want to, sure. yeah. to put you, I want to put you in the best situation to succeed. And that, whether that's me, with me or you or somebody else, um, we need to find a position where athletes are individualized at a high level based on their needs. So for example, obviously I work with Garrison directly. Um, yeah. it's, funny, it's funny that I do talk to him about him with the podcast is I see him on, he was actually here like 20 minutes ago. Um, and he is really, really good with those athletes who are domed up, who are mm-hmm. stuck in this internally focused feedback loop where they're trying to get it out of, out of their own way and they need feedback in a much more frequent basis. And, and I'm very self-aware of how I go about things and how, what kind of athletes work with me. And that's why like, I'm very on the one side. It's okay. I need guys who are that one to two times per week feedback. And we're talking about high level things, but I can't push them over the edge. But, and that's why we, we, we refer guys to each other. And obviously Garrison does a really good job with that. So I'm a hundred percent willing to go, Hey, you know what, Garrison, you, you can take ratings to this guy because he needs more feedback and he's not in that headspace. Um, so. For me, it's like, hey, kind of assessing the athlete based on how much feedback they want, where they've been, what their view was like, where they hurt. I mean, there's a thousand different feedback points that we need to take into account as coaches. Mm-hmm. 
And a lot of times we don't even focus on it. Like if I know that athlete has had three or four shoulder surgeries, I know I, I'm, a, I'm a really good option for him just because I've been there. I can talk about the shit that most people don't. It's like, I know how it feels to break up scar tissue. I know how it feels to feel like, oh, did I blow my leg around again? No, I'm breaking up scar tissue. Um, uh, so, I mean, the individuality in the remote training field is lacking. I mean, let's call a spade a spade. And I think that as coaches, we need to understand that. And we need to be able to be self-aware to find out what's best for the athlete at the end of the day. Yeah, I, you know, we've talked about it. Uh, in the past, I, I think there's a bigger problem to solve here, right? And the communication yeah. one is, is certainly the largest, right? And uh, there isn't currently a great solution for it, which sure. is okay. Um, and we, as technology rises, there will be better solutions, right? And and better, and it, you know, creative people will come along and, and delve into it and, um, you know, start to solve those those bigger problems like you just mentioning right there because none of what you just talked about is theory, right? Uh, in terms of like, not mechanical theory, it's not physiology theory, it's not, sure. right? It's, it's communication. And at the end of the day, that is the obstacle that gets in our way when it comes to remote training. But I commend you guys for being um, self-aware because as a coach, I think oftentimes too, and I'll, I'll speak solely on myself there, that that is something I have to work the most on in a lot of scenarios because I might be overly zealous on something that, you know, I, I'm combining a bunch of different thoughts and feel like I've really learned something. I sure. want to, I want to, I want to deliver it right away to an athlete and I have to be self-aware of, wait a minute, am I giving that athlete too much in this moment? Am I not the right guy to deliver that message? You know, to see have a better relationship with that client B, I don't want to fracture that relationship by them thinking, Hey, I'm the guy that you actually have to come to. I want that relationship to still stay strong. Um, so I, I, I commend that, that balance that you guys have. Um, okay. So like, let's say you have a guy training with you, right? Where, what sure. are you looking at in terms of like consistent data to, to sort of let him know, Hey, I'm progressing outside of like your traditional, like, Hey, yeah. If they're coming to you for kilo and like you're sure. training them to be better at that or training them to be a benefit culture or so on and so forth. But yeah. how are you undulating their program? I would say. No. Obviously with, um, programming wise, obviously our platform tracks every single, uh, training session they go through and basically uses RP as a way to adjust data points. Right. Obviously I've had an athlete recently, um, where his RP on a lot of his, what we we'll call them, uh, movement based, uh, pattern A has gone up from three to six over the last couple of weeks. That's, and just so people can understand, so the movement based sure. pattern, typically you're expecting that to be a lighter day. Correct. hundred percent where they're in a situation where, Hey, I'm going to work on some creating some feel, uh, and kind of externally focused, which can create feel within a movement pattern and their RP is six, seven, eight, nine. And that's a and huge red flag. Are you out of 10 on um, that RP? Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, so obviously two different scales of RPE, but so we yeah, got through but... one through one to one through 10. Um, and that's a huge red flag more often than not. It's like, well, are we putting too much training stimulus into this? Uh, movement-based light work instead of actually focusing on what we're trying to do. Because at the end of the day, feel-based work shouldn't be high effort in the first place. It's like, well, I'm right. trying to create feedback. Like I'm trying to create instantaneous feedback to creating a motor pattern. Um, and I've had to have a lot of conversation with guys like, hey, like we need to tone it back. I have one pro guy who was like, hey, I'm I'm really focused on this med ball stuff. And I was like, hey, what was the RPE? Like a 10, like, sure, what? We just threw <laughs> yesterday. I was like, we just threw yesterday and we're trying to create this massive feel by going 100% again. Like that's yeah. w- workload is like a huge problem in the industry in the first place. It's just yep. all guys are very one side. It's like, hey, I'm going to be seven plus every single day. Now, I was that guy early on in my career. I was seven plus every day, regardless. Um, but in the day, the central nervous system fatigue based on that is massive. And the implications are huge. Um, so obviously that being one data point. And then obviously when I go about guy submitting video specifically is I don't even allow a response for myself until they give me their initial feedback where but they're giving yeah, hey, what do you, what do you say? Hey, what do you yeah. say? Hey, what do you feel like you improved with today? What did you feel like? What was the biggest change you saw from session to session? Like, did you feel a change or yeah. did you not? And then getting that feedback, it's like, okay, well, I'm seeing the same thing or I have a different perspective. But unless we collect context with athletes, especially in that scenario when it comes to remote, 
we're not going to get anywhere. It's like, I don't know when this guy feels on a regular basis. I need to know this. And that's why I've had an athlete get frustrated. It's like, hey, why can't you just give me feedback as soon as I get it? Because mm-hmm. I need you to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. And mm-hmm. if you are feeling one thing and we're trying to do something else, then we need to correct that issue. That we need to correct, come steer the ship in the other direction. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the hardest part of our training is understanding what kind of feedback these guys are actually getting. And if I don't ask, if I don't ask targeted questions to match up with the blueprint that I'm trying to create, that I'm not going, I'm basically banging my head against the wall. It's like, well, there's no benefit there at the end of the day. I couldn't agree more. And I am, uh, I, the point you made there was always that feedback first before you give it. Uh, I will always remember I provided Early on uh, my career, I provided feedback to somebody when they gave me a video and like, I think I ripped the part of the video. I was like, hey, no, no. And it's like this, this, this. And they were like, me, I felt fucking great today. And I was like, shit, all right. <laughs> I feel sure. It's like, oh, hey, <laughs> hey screw, screw what you felt. This is what I saw. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care that you dominated the game. But like, you know, it was it, it was a, it was a learning curve for me as well during that time. And it was like this big moment for me where I was like, okay, wait a minute, it, take my ego out of it. Just cause I see something yep. doesn't mean that needs to be said. It just is, let me see what happened here. And then maybe over time, those changes start to creep into that. Yeah. And honestly, um, that's not, that's a huge problem in general. It's like with most coaches, like getting into the field specifically, regardless of their experience in the first place is yep. they forget why, what, what we're doing. It's like, well, Whatever. if the athlete dominated doing X, Y, or Z, who am I to say otherwise? It's like, well, I he don't, 90, I like he was 93, 96 doing this, right? He felt great. Yeah. There might've been a mechanical variable that was on, but why am I going about changing this? There's no reason. Like if there's, well, I think it's, 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 you know, I think a lot of times too, and, and, you know, I, I always try and place myself in both sides of that, right? And right. and like I'm empathetic to the coach because I understand how hard like I, I legitimately think we have one of the worst and greatest jobs ever. Um we have one of the worst because you have to understand psychology, physiology, uh biomechanics, um spin metric. Sure. Uh oh, by the way, if you want to make any money, business and marketing <laughs> and like I'll keep going, but like those yeah. aren't like, those aren't like n- not sort of complex things, right? Like human physiology is changing by the day in terms yeah. of what we understand. Uh, pitching biomechanics can not seem somewhat more centered and, and stable, but like all the rest of those things are, are like variables that are constantly changing. And we have to learn all those things. So when a coach learns some of that stuff, their eagerness to share it can be both ego-driven and you know, sort of eccentric, eccentrically driven. Like right. I want to help this kid, but the unfortunate nature is like, you have to ask yourself these first two questions right off the shoot. Like this dude in pain, this dude performing well. And like it, if it's no to the pain and yes to the well, like whack the Ferrari dude and be all right with it for the moment. Sure. And, you know, help guide and make sure that, you know, we don't fall off that track, but, um, cool. So I want to get into the more of the nuts and bolts now. Sure. Um, I'm, uh, again, as I've said, and, and if anybody that, you know, is listening, hasn't checked out some of your posts, uh, especially if you're a coach, I, I strongly suggest that because just the, the manner in which you are able to articulate with written word is, is I think very, very high level. I think that's an incredibly challenging thing to do. Um, I am obviously first to try and talk more than I would prefer to write it. Um, but I like talking way too much. So, For sure. um, but the, I love how well you articulate, uh, and you already mentioned before, like having a distal based focus, you are proximal to distal, um, sort of complex. And then let's, let's blend that into how that intertwines into your belief behind the lower half functionality. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of times, uh, guys get caught up into individual pieces, right? So I look at, uh, mechanics as an ever changing scope uh, perspective, right? If I'm not able to change my scope, it's like, yeah, I might see something associated with the ankle when it comes to eversion, or I may see something when it comes to the dumping into uh, IR too early. But at the end of the day, is that the root of the problem? So when I look at lower half physiology or mechanics in general, it's it's always a cause and effect. 99.9% of the time, I can find the root of the issue somewhere 
if I look at video. And the problem is video, we, we see individual breakdowns when it comes to motor patterns. It's like, well, what actually controls the distal segments? Like obviously proximal fragments. So if my torso and pelvis are in a certain position, but they're going to, the rest of the body organizes so basically by association. Right. So if I'm in a situation where my pelvis is leaking in front of my torso, when it comes to the lower half, you have to expect that there's going to be like compensations one way or another. Uh, and the problem is a lot of times we attack those compensations versus the problem. So for example, if I don't have enough context, like, Hey, where is this guy physiology wise on the spectrum? Is he, does he have more internal rotation or external rotation? Well, that's one piece of context. The other piece of context is, is he trying to go into a vertical chin pattern? because some coach told him to, or is he not? So addressing the context part is super, super important. And that's something that's often overlooked is if I don't have all the context available. And that's why when you see guys on video, and I've had conversations with coaches pretty much weekly about, hey, well, how can you explain like internal versus sexual bias, right? As far as the lower half is concerned, it's like, well, it's not that simple. Is if a guy is doing something subjectively, like, hey, I'm trying to force my pelvis back or I'm for trying to stay over the rubber or whatever else, they're all intertwined. And I'm kind of going back to what you said about um, physiology, data metrics, uh, strength conditioning, et cetera. They're all intertwined one way or another. If I can't change my perspective and I'll see how those connect to one another, I'm not seeing the bigger picture. It's like, well, sure. if, if I'm trying to fix a lower half problem, a lot of times some, pe some people in the industry will be like, well, What's the dress on the weight room? Another one would be like, here's a throwing drill. Oh no, here, there's another one. Here's a, here's a cue. But when it comes to the lower half, I need to be able to like be true the frost and figure out, okay, what is the root of the problem? And that's why we ask targeted questions when it comes to the lower half to guys. And obviously with a lot of the higher level guys I've worked with who are 95 plus mile hour throwers, like I mentioned earlier in the podcast was the blueprint is already there, right? Because yeah. I know how you threw 97, we can find a way back, whether we like it or not. But it's looking at the individual pieces, what has been manipulated over time. And whether or not that manipulation was beneficial or not. Um, Correct. Which I think is so interesting, right? Sometimes guys, uh, they get so caught in making the adjustment that they lose sight of the fact that like, wait a minute, like I'm actually not performing as well as I'm trying to make this adjustment. Yeah. Um, which I think is like a telltale sign right away. Hey, hey, we should probably take a look at what we're doing. Um, yeah. So how much, when we're talking about lower half, right? And sure. listen, it, it, all of these things, and I ask these questions because they, they thoroughly intrigue me how people see movement, because I think sure. just as the way, like some people see language, because most of it is nonverbal, I think a lot of people can see movement before it even is about to occur. Yeah. And, um, how much of like, you know, cause you're saying, Hey, I'm watching a video, right? Feed of that movement then impact, uh, sort of your thought process of like assuming contact is level, right? Assuming the sure. person hasn't been overcoached, yeah. right? How much of the speed of the movement, so right, the, the torques that are going on, the force, sure. the momentum and everything else, how that interplays now into how you're going to try and understand their lower half patterning. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point. Because I actually had a conversation with what, a professional coach probably a couple months ago. He was talking about a guy at the highest level and he was looking at his final mechanics report. He's like, hey, well, his rotational velocity of his torso is down or his pelvic rotational velocity is up. Well, when you look at it that from multiple perspectives is depending on the guy, those numbers are going to be drastically different. And yeah. Soon, down you know, with that, that comparing thing, with that comparing uh, him to him or him to someone else? Correct. Him to him. So him okay. being not 98 versus 93 mm -hmm. or, and they were, the biggest thing they were trying to do was like increasing one versus the other, just at its base. It's like, well, is that really the problem here? Is like, is that really the way we're going to go about it is let's do more rotational velocity with, or upper half constraint drills to help speed up the torso. It's like, that seems counterintuitive more often than not. It's like, well, what are, what are we trying to accomplish here? It's like, if we know anything about how energy is transferred from one segment to another, why are we focusing on trying to speed up his torso? Like that seems asinine. Um, and a lot of times I was like, Hey, like you ever thought about like finding out what he's trying to accomplish at this point? And lo and behold, he was trying to force himself to stay over the rubber, creating compensation after compensation after compensation which led to a B-Logan decrease of five miles an hour. 
and then adjusting one small thing of like, hey, stop trying to stick your knee over the rubber and let's allow it to organize was plus four just from the get go. Um, and that's where the blueprint concept comes into a, a huge play for guys, especially higher level. But as far as how we kind of understand the lower hash on a daily basis with an athlete is feedback is everything. But then at the same time, we don't, it's not as important. Because if we can uh, watch an athlete moves, we can ha- provide pieces of context or get a piece of clues to figure out, hey, is this how he authentically moves or is this? So a way that I kind of go about that a lot of times is through non-throwing related drills, like med ball drills specifically. Because if I'm trying and t- taking manipulating the task or the skill acquisition triangle, it's like, well, if I can take it away from the actual task of throwing and I can find out how he produces force in a linear fashion in a med ball shot throw, I can get instant context of how he organizes lower half versus the throw. But a lot of times coaches, we just, hey, well, if you're struggling with lower half, let's do this drill, this drill, this drill, and figure out how that's going to work. But at the same time as well, is that really the best avenue more often than not? Totally get it. That's amazing. Well said. Um, speaking to sort of, you know, we've we mentioned physiology. Right. Sure. And uh, so we've gone from obviously the structural side of it with the proximal sure. pistol, but um, have sort of ventured away from some of the muscle skeletal. Sure. Um, let's dive into a little bit of, because I know you've been posting on it recently, right? So anatomy sure. dreams and, and just the uh, cumbersome nature of that book. Um, but the, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're, you're just, you're, I guess, in, uh, introduction of fascial plane into now how you might be adjusting that into coaching. Yeah. So the, well, first off, the first time I read through the book, I got nothing. I read through the entire book and I was like, well, dude, what am I reading right now? I don't understand yeah. any of this. And obviously I have like a pretty good like, background in anatomy, anatomy and physiology anyway. And I was completely lost. I'm like, dude, what are we yeah, talking about over here? Yep. And I'm saying I've read it probably three or four times already. And now I'm starting to kind of figure out like, well, the problem is, is when people read things like anatomy trains and they take little pieces like, Hey, let's use the spiral line or the front functional line, whatever they take it as, Oh, well, we need to just load this line. It's like, well, mm-hmm. if it was all, if it was that simple, or we focus that with everything. Same thing with like, when talk, people talk about like rolling drills, for example, um, I'm pre-tensioning the front functional line and the spiral line just because I'm the pelvis is one way and my upper body is another way. I'm pre-tensioning it. So obviously we're going to just drill harder out of a rolling drill predominantly because that's already happening. The hard part is the linear move and organizing the rest anyway. Um, so the way I use uh, anatomy traits and uh, uh, fashion meridians is the problem solve physiological issues or how they impact mechanics. So for example, um, guys who are kind of limited in tenor rotation and they're throwing in inter-rotation dominant patterns, it's like, well, you can see the breakdowns happen if we change our perspective, right? So looking through like frame by frame video, it's like, well, when people look at like inter-rotation bias and extra rotation bias of lower half, people see like, oh, well, if the knee turns over, it's inter-rotation. But when in reality, the heel connects, disconnects off the ground, which just frees up the joint to move. So do they have inter-rotation in the first place? I don't know. Probably not. Um, right. And I think that's where people get lost in it. But if you look at like fashion meridians and how we generate elastic energy over the course of movement, like looking at how the adductors are moving in relationship to the torso, because obviously the front functional line goes from your pelvic, pal- your back all the way down to the other, the opposite adductor across your pelvis. If I can see the breakdown happening one way or another, I can use that as a tool to problem solve where the issue is, whether it be physiological or mechanical. It's just another way to kind of use perspective to problem solve mechanical issues, whether it be I can address them in the weight room or not. Cool. Another tool. Uh, another tool. The, the, yeah. The, um, so building off of sort of, you know, uh, the context there taken from the book or taken from how somebody is understanding it or applying it, right? Uh, our fascial plane and then our muscular physiology, right? The, the internal rotation that you're talking about there where the back heel comes off, right? I want to understand from you and sort of your evaluation. And you don't got to go to in depth, right? Yeah. But like we, you, you, you grazed over that, right? And I want people to, to be able to get that concept there. Cause sure. 
the difference you just referenced there is PAC versus non-PAC and whether the pelvis is articulating the femur or the femur is articulating within the pelvis, right? And if for people to understand that, that means the the leg bone is moving or the pelvis is moving about the leg bone. You two vastly different actions that are going on the hip, driven by two totally different, uh, we can call it fascial planes, or you can sure. call it group yeah. muscles, or you could say whatever you want. And I didn't mean to be cumbersome there in my language, but it was it was really just how important are both of those features to you, which um, so pack and unpack, uh, range of motion. And then obviously being remote, it's difficult to perform a passive or an active, right. To really get that perspective. Sure. Obviously, um, using that as a tool, it's, it's something that a lot of people really don't understand because it is a very complex concept. It may seem simple. Like obviously you mentioned how, um, obviously the femur going around, but basically articulating in rotation with a fixed pelvis or, or a pelvis moving around the femur. It seems simple at its core, but it's super complex at the same time, because what we need to understand is the pelvis could be in completely different positions, well, mm-hmm. which will completely change on how we need to approach it mechanically because Guys who, like for example, there are plenty of guys who are external rotation dominant where they'll coil into your back leg and then their pelvis sits in a neutral position during a linear move. So, but then if we're taking it like at its, at its like base point, it's like, well, he's not winding into inter- interior rotation and then using that the entire time. He's using it as a tool to set up his pelvis into a position during a linear move where he can create force. So it's always a S22 when we talk about, this is why I don't talk about inter rotation, the differences with athletes more often. I just work, I just work on it in super basic lines. Like, Hey, are we trying to get our pelvis into a neutral position or do you want our pelvis to be in a more closed position? And based on their physiology or how they're organizing, you can figure that out over time. But a lot of times we see it, watch a video in one dimension. It's like, well, okay, I'm gonna look at a side view, his knee. I could, it's kind of turning over. So I think he has internal rotation. So let's, let's force that. Let's go into more internal rotation focus. But you look at six other views, whether it be a front view, back view, and or behind them, it's like, well, I'm seeing something completely different. And I think that's where coaches kind of a lot of times miss the boat. They'll look at one video. I see guys on social media do it all the time. They'll watch a side view and create this huge mechanical breakdown around that side view. It's like, well, you got one piece of context out of, the entire boat. So how can we actually use that to create a drill set or create an emphasis if we don't know the entire picture? I mean, you look at guys like Ben Joyce, like obviously through Hunter Drive in Tennessee and now it's pitching the Angels. If you look at him from different views, you see completely different things. And it's hard to kind of figure out where those actually work um, and where I can kind of use them to provide a program or provide a guidance in that direction. Um, but like I said before, like how we talked about coaching and it comes to feedback, we need to know our place and we don't want to be in a situation where guys get lost. And that's why I use social media as that platform. When I talk about internal rotation is I use like uh, animations or whatever else to kind of push that point home without overloading the concept. Because I mean, internal rotation with the adductors, like with adductors by one roll, one being short, one being long, the glute maybe, and other, I mean, there's a thousand different pieces that go into it. It's all about like, hey, well, how can I simplify this to the athlete in some way, somehow? Mm. I think my favorite part of that was you stating that you were going to figure out how he utilized his bias over time. And mm. I think we're, uh, you know, we often say this here in our initial eval, look, this is a glint into what is going on with you. We can, like, based off of like comparisons that we can give you, we can tell you like sort of where you're at, but like ultimately it's going to take up a month to truly get any sort of idea of who you actually are. Oh, um, for sure. And then you go to the point where like, oh, I opened up some range in my adductors. I opened some range in my hip. Yeah. And now it looks drastically different than it did before. Yep. So yep. You like, and I think that's an awesome point. It's something that everyone who's listening to us needs to understand is like when you open up range within the joint or get stronger or your physiology changes in any way, shape or form, there are going to be mechanical changes, whether we like it or not. So we use our brain trend. Yeah, yeah, you have to understand whether to- those are good or bad. Yeah, hundred percent. That's why, like, when we look at assessments, it can't be as simple as, oh, you don't have enough internal rotation or you don't have enough external rotation. Well, maybe you don't need internal rotation. I have zero external rotation. Done. It's brutal. And I have like 45 degrees of internal rotation on both legs. 
does it really worth my time opening up range and extra rotation? Probably not. Number one, my femur is probably retroverted as hell or no, anti-verted as hell. Oh, so like, why would I try and force the femur where it's not going to go? And I think right. that's one of the, that's the hard part is figuring out people. I've had some people talk to me and I get messed in DMs like, Hey, physiological biases aren't a thing. I'm like, are you sure about that? Because in every single movement we ever make, whether it be pitching or hitting or golfing or soccer or whatever else, we're going to create a bias over time, whether we like it or not. The same reason why people who pick up baseball later in life usually can't open up enough external rotation because they're well, they have retroverted. Re- yeah, yeah. Correct. Correct. No, I mean, and then, so that's like a huge example of bias. And But the same thing happens with pitching or hitting or anything else. So we have to understand like there is a role one way or another. Well, I, I think the other interesting point there is too, is like, there's definitely biases, right? People, and, and sure. a bias is nothing more than a compensation, right? Sure. It's the compensation that I perpetually have done. Correct. Right? A lot of times is, why is that bad? Like, and I think oftentimes, right? So um, I, I know he's been in this field for a while. I've been in the field for over 15 years, right? So I've gone through the whole stage where uh, uh, training conditioning coaches were bodybuilders and they were PTs. Um, now we're coming into the era where like, Hey, we got to know everything. Um, yeah. so we're much more hybrid. Right. But like when we were going through the PT realm, uh, of the frame conditioning world and everybody wanted no asymmetry and no compensation and like, uh, I mean, it was one of the worst, the, the education was so guarded and one sided towards like be perfect and be and sure. probably the same. And, and, um, the idea that we couldn't have movement based biases is mind blowing to me when you can just see how different, if we didn't have any biases, then why didn't everybody throw the exact same way? Correct. Let's do the question. But there's so coaches out there that think that's a thing. It's like I, opening up, just like, hey, we need to be open. Like, am I still just have the same internal rotation and external rotation on every single joint? Like, there's no, I, like, I has to. I has to. Okay, because like, then we we would never have deception. We would never have altered pitch sequences. Like we have to right. understand, like any any, and I think this is the other problem too. Like, and and you had mentioned this before. I might see something in Everse, and I might see something in this, and I think you know the resounding message from you is like, don't act, just watch, and then we'll act over time as we sure. you know we start to learn more information. But I I think people are so quick to jump the gum and gun and make these these changes and not understand the ramifications upstream and. And how that can play later into pitch metrics, into, you know, arm health, into longevity, into, you know, a, a whole host of other things, just simply because we've altered some movement bias. Um, yeah. But uh, so okay. like, could you could you imagine like someone changing, like, you know, Justin Lawrence from the Rockies goes completely across his body. Could you imagine if, hey, I'm going to really focus on getting this guy external, like, oh, external rotation dominant with his lower half or whatever else. It would be a disaster. It's like, well, right. for what? It doesn't matter that he he strives a foot and a half cross body. It works for him. Let's use right. the unique characteristics of the athlete. And if there are some ramifications as far as injuries, we address them. And if there isn't, we let it leave him alone. And let's let it ride. Yeah. And I think, you know, more and more for us too, because we have a lot of, you know, we have a, a, a huge population of high school guys, right? And high school guys are in a rush to be what college guys or pro guys. Yes. And they want to be doing what those guys are doing right off the bat when they're not skeletally mature enough to be doing oftentimes a lot of those things. They, in the era of transfer portal and, you know, uh, huge scholarship, now you have guys chasing VLO numbers. And I mean, don't get me wrong, obviously with the name of our company, we understand the importance of velocity, but like the, the ramification of trying to make drastic changes with these young ages to what that can mean later in life, um, is just mind blowing. And, and not to mention how domed up, I mean, we have seen the greatest progress in, to be honest, from like taking really athletic guys and saying, you have no more drills. Uh, we're going to have you field ground ball. We're going to have you throw from really awkward positions. And we're going to start to make like minor tweaks over time. Um, yeah. But okay. Uh, listen, I mean, you have been literally awesome. I like finishing with uh, one thing, which is like, what right now is a thought taking up space in your mind that's like an itch you want to scratch in terms of something maybe you want to learn or something you're like looking forward to that you really want to start to apply, something like that? 
honestly, the biggest thing I wanted to learn, I actually touched on earlier in this podcast, is the psychological aspect of the game. Because as much as I, I understand it on a personal level through experience, I'd like to be in a situation where I can implement it on a high level um, based on knowledge, right? And be able to kind of customize someone's experience based on psychology. Right. And obviously, uh, fly, navigate a lot of these issues through there. Because I'm obviously I'm very objective when it comes to physiology and mechanics and whatnot. Um, it's a very big gray area. That's something I had to work through on my own. And I'd like to be able to uh, dive more into that uh, and help guys on a high level with that as well. Um, and it sounds like something I lack just because I'm very, being felt biased based on my experience. I do have perspective on both sides, but I'd like to help guys at a really high level anyway um, and learn as much as I can on that. So I've uh, obviously dove into a lot of it's like you support the college books and all kinds of things, trying to figure out, hey, what little pieces can I use to kind of elevate cool. this guy's career? Very cool. Very cool. Well, listen, I can tell you from firsthand experience, uh, step one is getting them to be aware. And then from there, it's really no different than everything else you have talked about um, in how you approach the way you train somebody is that not everybody's the same and they're not all going to need the same blueprint. Uh, going in from a mental advocate and, you know, speaking to our guys, anybody listening to this, uh, the number one message they all need to know is they're not alone. They're not alone in the way they're feeling. Um, and there is every single person that is out there has gone through some bout of anxiety, some bout of, you know, imposter syndrome, some bout of thinking they just weren't, uh, who they thought they were. And the idea that they can have a sounding board. To uh, have that is perhaps the most important aspect we can provide as coaches. So uh, I commend to, you on taking that front. It's uh, it is a it is a, a tough one because you you then wear a lot of their ink as well. Um, so uh, be weary as you start shutting down that front. Um, but uh, man, this is this is an awesome chat. I really do appreciate your time. Um, oh, for sure. And. and um, you know, anybody who hasn't checked out your stuff, just let them know where they can find you real quick. Oh, yeah. So you can find me on, um, obviously, you got threads, you got Instagram, Twitter, it's chaos. Um, <laughs> but you can find me at, you can find me at Coach Blank uh, on Instagram, Twitter, threads. Uh, obviously, you can find me on LinkedIn for those who like LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, I mean, those are my main platforms. Uh, but I'm always open for DMs. If people want to talk shop, I'm always open, uh, no matter what the question is. Um, so I'm definitely looking forward to it. There are some questions over the course of time, uh, especially from this podcast and whatnot. Um, but I can't uh, recommend the guys that deal with you enough um, just because I know a lot of guys who have been there in the past, um, whether it be Andrew Amato or all these other guys um, who have rolled through the program and, and whatnot. I mean, James Ray, uh, Hero Wyatt, all these other dudes. Um, I think you guys are doing an incredible job up there, especially for the high school age Ashley and above. I mean, that's not something that's uh, popular in the yeah. grand scheme of our uh, base of development. Because everybody want to, wants to work with the one percent. Um, I think a lot of times we get uh, more value out of the guys who are in the lower levels of the game, and especially with the competition that college baseball now is like. It's even more important now than ever um, because giving you guys the opportunity to kind of let it eat and have them have their shot. Appreciate that, man. Thank you again for your time. Of course.